In this, our final lecture, I want to try to tackle a more realistic example. It's also about semantics, and because it's more realistic, we're, we're not going to get the nice, tidy, kind of finished proof like we have seen in the other examples. What I'm going to do instead is go through part of a real development just to give you an idea. Uh, I have, I'm aware that we have had the kind of induction auto syndrome where a lot of the stuff we have looked at was really trivial and you've not had much exposure to the kind of awful stuff that you get out in the wild. So what we're going to do then, we'll look at uh, a treatment of the lambda calculus or I could say, let's say, a baby functional language based on the lambda calculus. Um, so there will be a small step semantics and a big step semantics. And there was part of, so this part of a big development which did a whole bunch of things, among them was proving the equivalence between the two semantics. So I'll just get far enough to set up some of this stuff. And really you're going to get a glimpse at how some of these things are formalized. We're still not using the a nominal package, which I mentioned at the end of the previous lecture on semantics, lecture 10. So I'll be doing this in a naive way, and it will be good enough for today. And then when we finish this lecture, and of course, um, the entire series of lectures uh, have a, just some overview remarks about things that we weren't able to cover in more depth. Um, things like type classes and so on and so forth. So what lambda calculus are we doing today? Uh, you sh I'm sure you've all seen the lambda calculus before, so you know you have abstraction over a bound variable um, and application of one term to another. And here we also have if then else and we have built-in integers. Now, you maybe will remember from the lambda calculus that, in fact, all kinds of data structures are definable directly in the pure lambda calculus, and it's actually kind of cool how all that works, but it's not relevant today. So we all have integers built in. This language will use call-by-value semantics, again, a refresher if you've not you don't remember from before. Call by value is what happens in a normal programming language like, for example, ML or OCaml, and not in a, shall we say, abnormal language like Haskell. Um, that is to say, the arguments are evaluated prior to entering a function. Uh, and I have there a credit, so I have stolen this from Isabel's archive of formal proofs which has a much, much more material in there. And incidentally, if you do a big, let's say you do an Isabel-based project for your uh, um, part three or ACS, then you might have your own AFP entry ready to submit by June. And that might be cool. So this archive of formal proofs stores, I guess there are more than 600, I can't remember, something like 600 ent entries and about 3 million lines of Isabel um, stored and maintained in perpetuity, or at least as long as all of us live, um, uh, covering a vast uh, variety of topics. So here is the lambda calculus as formalized here. So we have, we introduce a type of names I mean, a bit analogous to the locations in the previous example, the names are not specified in any way. Now, I will say that it, the nominal package would be probably a better treatment of this, although the guy who did this, who was certainly smart enough and experienced enough to use a nominal package, had his own reasons not to. That is his choice. And certainly in this case, we have a very straightforward definition of lambda expressions where you can see, I can't remember why everything begins with E, maybe to do with expressions. 
making the variable with a particular name, a numeric constant which has the actual number stored. The third one there is a lambda abstraction, so pairing a name with it, the body of the abstraction. Then you have an application of one expression to another. Um, now this thing E prim on the second line is allowing basically arbitrarily many functions to be built into the language itself. So rather than saying we have, let's say, plus, minus, times, or whatever, it's saying here any function that takes two natural numbers and gives you another natural number can be included as a primitive of this language. Now, as in our previous example, um, this sort of thing is not a realistic programming language because that function doesn't even need to be computable, but it certainly helps us get off the ground here. The last one is an if-then-else. Uh, now, the next two functions are quite straightforward. They are the functions for returning the free variables and the bound variables of a lambda expression. Um, so, as you remember, the free variables are the ones that are not bound. So, in particular, the only interesting case in the FV function, the free variable function, is in the case of a lambda abstraction where you take the free variables of the body and subtract out the bound variable itself. The one below is giving you the set of bound variables. Uh, the bound variables are simply the ones explicitly bound inside a lambda. Now, I can give you a little teaser for the nominal package in case any of you are curious. If we use the nominal package, we could still have the free variable function. Turns out the bound variable function would no longer be definable. And the idea is, if you have thinking of bound variables in their true sense, these local names are insignificant. So lambda xx is the same as lambda yy. And the way the package works, you would not, in fact, be allowed to define a function that grabs names of bound variables and pulls them out. The way it works is really kind of weird, so, which is why it's not covered in the course here. Okay, now we're going to do some fairly straightforward functions here to, to go over the syntax. So, for example, they're substituting something for a name. Um, so, x is the variable name I'm going to replace. V is the term that I want to replace the variable with. I don't need to go through all the cases, but you can see that, say, numbers are not affected by substitution. In the first line of a function, the variable is replaced just if x equals y, that is, just if the variable we're looking at is the variable we're substituting. Um, and then the other cases are going down recursively. Now, what we have here, the next function is the idea of a normal form. Now, again, you may remember from a lambda calculus course, you may have taken that normal forms are, form, are, are expressions that are not reduced. And in this case, now, this definition of normal form is typical of a call by value semantics, where anything with a lambda at the front will be in normal form. This is not what you may recall from a lambda calculus course in the past, because typically they would talk about a beta normal form, and you could do a beta reduction inside the body. We're not allowing that here. Uh, now, finally, for this semantics, we are defining a value. That's at the very bottom of the slide. A value is a term that is in normal form. That is, it's either a number or it's a lambda. And moreover, it has no free variables. Ah, I'm using abbreviations. So this is a, 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 a aside here. Normally, we introduce new things by definition. Now, an abbreviation is the same thing as a definition, except that no actual term is value exists. So 
In other words, if I write is value v, it is immediately expanded into the conjunction you see. I'm not sure I approve of this one, actually, so I must have copied this from the AFP entry. You see, he takes v, and it is, appears twice on the right-hand side. Now, as a general rule, one should be suspicious of any operation that doubles an, a, a, an expression like v. I suppose it is harmless here, because if we're lucky, all the v's will be just atomic. But you never know. Um, anyway, so this is identifying values to be just those lambda expressions described on the right-hand side there. OK, so that's our syntax for our lambda calculus. Now the semantics, and this is a small step semantics. So I hope you will remember from a semantics course you will certainly have taken. Um, I don't want to go through all these in detail. These are absolutely standard. But for example, the very first one is doing a beta reduction. Because it's called by value, so you see the argument of this beta reduction for the very first thing on the first line has to be v, has to be a value. So only values can be substituted into function bodies. That's where the call by value comes from. Um, the next on the line below is how the semantics causes the further evaluation of the two expressions that form a function application. Um, and they are necessary clearly. So if you look at the, again, in the second line, either of those rules, if a reduction can happen, then the thing being reduced is not a value by definition. Values are not reducible. So the first line is taking care of the values, and the second line is taking care of things that are not yet values. And so on, the if-then-else, I should mention we don't have Booleans. So how does if-then-else work? If then else works? It works by saying zero is false. Anything non-zero is true. So that's what we see at the penultimate line on this page. It is a small step semantics, and that's why here, for example, with if, we need three rules, where with a big step semantics, you would only have two. So the very last uh, line on this page, or the last rule shown on this page, is a single step evaluation of the condition. Now, we convert this into Isabel. Uh, and there's really nothing to say. So all we've done is type it in. And that is how it should be. So it's, this is the whole point of doing logic in this way, is, is to have a notation that is reasonably close. You can see there that in reduce is an inductive relation. It has an infix syntax. Um, so we can write this stuff pretty neatly. Uh, and as I've mentioned in previous lectures, it's a good idea to make the introduction rules there and declare them to Isabel's automation. Well, I hope you're all looking forward to a bright future in industry. Where's the big step semantics? It looks like this. So this is the same language, different semantics. And of course, this is the kind of exercise you see in semantics. I mean, I'm kind of part of my brain is saying, why do it twice? But there must be reason. So anyway, they did it twice. Uh, maybe it's simply an exercise to show the equivalence. Um, also, there are some different elements in this semantics. So, in particular, we have an environment. Um, see a Greek letter rho, which is the very first character on the slide there. So, this rho, I don't know why they use rho for environments. They've done it since long before you were born, incidentally. But this is going to map variables to uh, values, I guess. 
So, and of course, the big downward arrow is going to be the big step. So natural numbers go to themselves. Variables, the second uh, thing there, a variable evaluates to its stored value in the environment. Um, and quite an interesting thing, if you look at the third one on the top line, that's basically a function closure. So if I have a lambda expression, lambda xe, evaluated in an environment row, it will evaluate to a function value which is a triple consisting of the bound variable name, the expression body, and the environment itself. Now I hope you've all come across closures elsewhere in a semantics course. Well, if not, you know, it's not critical. I mean, we're just looking at this at a high level, but certainly if you have heard of closures before, that's one of them. And the point of that value is that if we then apply this function value to an argument later on, we will be able to evaluate the body E in the environment it's expecting because that is the stored row that we've got there. Um, looking at the bottom, for example, now the if-then-else becomes more straightforward. So the condition of the if, which is E, we evaluate it down to get a value. If that value is zero, we regard it as false and evaluate the, the last expression. If it is non-zero, we evaluate the E1 in, in the middle. Ah. I should mention the penultimate rule because that shows you how a closure is ruled, is used. So there I'm trying to evaluate the application E1, E2. I evaluate E1 and it evaluates to a function closure. Now E2 we evaluate and we get the value W. What we now want to do is give W to the body of the stored function. That body is E, so there you see E is being evaluated there on the third assumption of that rule. The environment in which it's evaluated is row prime, the one that was stored in the closure. And you see that we have updated that environment to plug in W, that is the argument value, in place of X, which is the formal parameter. So all this makes sense, and that should show you how, you know, what closures actually do. Once again, we type it all into Isabel. Here we have a data type of values in this system. For so that very first thing at the top, a value is either a natural number or a closure. So the first constructor B nat of natural number. Um, and the closure case, which is the second one, see there is a name, an expression, and an environment, where an environment is this name cross bval list, associating names with values. And there I see I'm making a type synonym just below to abbreviate name cross bval list so that I can use it later on. So the next thing there, look up, is something that will look up an identifier in an environment. And you see, a lookup can fail. The way we handle failure here is by an option type, which I'm not sure I ever mentioned before. But option is a built-in type, which in the case of failure, we return the value none, which is one of the constructors of the option type. You can think of this, if you like, as if I didn't have the option type, I would use lists instead, and I would return either the empty list for a failure case or a one element list for the success case. And the only problem with that is you might not know, well, what if you return the two element list? What would that mean? So we have type option for which your only possibilities are none, meaning I don't have a value to give you, or some applied to some value and that is the success case. So, and this lookup is a perfectly obvious recursive function to look up something in a list of pairs. 
Finally, given those two, the actual evaluation relation here is once again the straightforward translation of the previous slide into an inductive definition. So the only reason I needed that bit of gobbledygook above is there are places where, I guess, in the evaluation of a variable rule, I need to be able to look up a variable in an environment. And if you look at the eval var rule, so it's the second one there in the inductive definition, it says, provided when I look up x in the environment, I get a value out. That is, you see, it says sum v. If I look it up and I'm successful, and it says x is bound to v, then this can evaluate the expression x and return v. So there is, in fact, no rule for the case where x is not defined in the environment. So in that, part, that case, it would actually not execute. OK, we have the small step and the big step. Um, and a reminder, I've told you these things before. The introduction rules of an inductive definition you can declare uh, using intro. You can declare other rules using intro as well. Um, this gets kind of delicate, so it's quite easy to blow up your search space. So I would say it takes a certain amount of experience. These, you should do this when this particular rule is really the obvious thing you should do. Maybe you've heard of the idea of a follow your nose proof. This often comes up in, for example, in discrete mathematics courses where they ask you to prove some little properties of sets. And usually the properties, although they may not be very obvious, they, there's always one step that's obvious. And if you keep doing the obvious step one after another, after another, after another, and maybe after 10 steps, suddenly you prove the damn thing even though you don't really know how you got there. So follow your nose proofs are what Isabel's automation is good at. And so I guess maybe you need an intuition as to whether the particular thing you've just proved would work well. In, in the case of intro, you want a thing that would be used in backwards chaining from the goal you're trying to prove to the knowledge you have already. Rule inversion is kind of the opposite in the particular case of an induction, inductive definition. It is um, kind of backward reasoning rather than, well, the other was backward reasoning. It's doing a different thing. Rule inversion is kind of a, uh, elimination rules from the, uh, to use a terminology of natural deduction. Um, so if you see patterns that make sense to, to be eliminated, then you can use inductive cases to simplify them. So here I have examples. So this is a very typical use of inductive cases where I have my inductive definition for the big step semantics, and we're wondering, uh, in the first case, what do I know about the value v that e naught of n can evaluate to? Intuitively, we know v has got to be n. Um, now, this is a different example. This is the if-then-else. And it's pretty damn hard to read. If I actually go backwards, um, remember, these, these rules that end with something like question mark P, they have the generic form of an elimination rule, which means that when you apply it, it will always succeed because the conclusion matches everything. And what's interesting is what happens in the first premise. So the first premise must match environment says a natural number N evaluates to V. That's what it will catch. And the output of that, so to speak, will be the formula V equals B naught N. So in this then more complicated example here, I, that's much harder to read, of course, but you can still see the conclusion is P. So then again, the conclusion will match everything. What happens happens in the assumptions where this time it is an if expression evaluating to V and 
you see there are two further cases that will be actually generated. One of them is when the condition evaluates to zero and the else part evaluates to V, or the condition evaluates to a thing which is non-zero and it's the then part that evaluates to V. Now, how do I know whether to set up rule inversion or not? Possibly the thing to do is not bother with it at first. Try to prove something. And when you look at things that are not getting proved, so look at them and carefully say, well, what's going on here? This is a case where it has natural number n evaluating to something. And I know that something has got to be natural number n. So I say, well, I want to get rid of this case. So I'll put in an inductive case to handle just that one thing that bugged me. Um, and if you keep doing that, you will get the ones you need. It maybe won't be a very systematic approach, but maybe it's all you need. Note these are declared using elim because they have the form of an elimination rule. And they use this bang. If you know prolog, it's funny because in prolog, this bang means a commitment to a choice. And that's kind of what it means here. So it is a kind of strong uh, forcing the theorem prover to use those particular rules. OK, need to keep moving. So here is another determinacy proof. This is looking at the big step semantics, and it's saying if E evaluates to V and V E evaluates to V prime in the same environment, then V equals V prime. It's quite similar to the one before. So I'm not going through it in detail. Um, I am guessing that I skipped over this because it's probably trivial. So, and the last one was, so I'm guessing this one was also trivial. But that is what the induction itself would look like. Now what I want to do is sketch out for you just part of the buildup that leads to the attempted proof that the small step and big step semantics are equivalent. I said, we're not actually going to go through the whole proof in detail because it's too much. Now, the problem with this is that we have a different setup. You see, the big step semantics introduced environments. And with environments, you don't do substitution, right? Instead of replacing x by v, you um, put x is bound to v in an environment. So we need to mediate between this difference. Uh, and we're going to do that here by introducing environments for the first semantic, that is for the kind of E semantics we saw in the beginning of the lecture. So there we introduce um, the type of environments with the E expressions as opposed to the B expression we had already. Then we define a substitution function that substitutes over these E expressions using environments. And then we define a few other things. Again, I'm not going to cover all the details because we're kind of looking over this development rather than following it in detail. I think maybe the only thing worth mentioning here um, is, I guess, the second line of the substitution function here. If you can remember from the previous one, we were replacing a single variable x by a single value v. What we're doing now is we have a whole environment, uh, which if you likely can regard, which is, a whole list of pairs representing a whole bunch of replacements we're doing simultaneously. So we look up x in the environment. If there's nothing, we do nothing as we return what we started with. Otherwise, we return the, the value that we were given. Um, gets uglier here. What we are trying to do here is make a relation between two kinds of values. So if you can read that thing, which is not very clear, I have to admit. Uh, and in fact, part of the problem is it is two things being defined simultaneously. We've not seen that before. So we are de declaring BS val 
which is relation relating the B semantics values with the E semantics values and simultaneously we are relating the two kinds of environments, that is the B semantic environments and the E semantics environments. And I guess they all have to be defined, why do they have to be defined simultaneously? Um, well, certainly the B values include environments. I mean, this is, a, this is clearly a more sophisticated thing to do. I, we have not come across simultaneous inductive definitions before. And the main point here is we're getting two inductive definitions out at the same time, and each depends on the other one. Clearly, this is a thing you need to do on occasion. But just looking at that, you see we are in the, there's a BS eval rule there relating to the natural number cases in each side. Interestingly, we are interleaving the definitions of BS val and BSN. So we then, the next one, um, uh, the next one is also BS val and what are you going to? Ooh, it's kind of awful. So BS val of a closure is being equated with a certain lambda expression involving an actual substitution. So it's kind of getting hairy here. Uh, the next thing down below is uh, we're doing some um, rule inversion, and then we're starting to see some proofs. Again, I'm not going through this in any detail. That's because it starts to look like this, and this is only the beginning. I don't remember how long this proof is. It is a pretty horrendous induction. So what is this trying to prove? It's saying, let's suppose expression E evaluates to value W in environment rho, where the environment rho is kind of equivalent to rho prime, which I guess is an E environment, and where the free variables of the expression are all included in the environment, that is, we know that everything used in the expression E is declared or bound in the environment, under all those conditions, there exists a value such that, I guess this is going to be an E value, that the E semantics will evaluate this thing to the value V, um, and that V will be equivalent to the original value w. So that's all a mouthful, and so it is not surprising that we get a huge amount of stuff. As I say, it goes on and on and on. And although it's very long, I hope you can see some structure there. So we're doing an induction over eval induct, and that's clearly the eval induct is the big step semantics there. The row is, the row prime is arbitrary which is not surprising because, okay, the row E and W will be fixed in the induction, um, but the row prime will be derived from rho, so clearly we need that to be able to vary. And the proof now, there are going to be many steps of the induction for each of the cases of the semantics. What we are looking at here is the single case of function application, which is eval app, and we're starting to work through what we've got. So here, I think we are, yes, there we are using, I think, our induction hypotheses to get some information about um, E1 and E2, through, again, by induction. Um, so without going through this proof in detail, I hope you can see at least that it has a logical structure and you could imagine how line by line you could develop it. And I guess most of you have already made good progress on your assessed exercises and are familiar with how this goes. So anyway, I can say goodbye to this now. And now I just want to talk about a few tips before we, before we finish. Here is, maybe I overemphasize this, but it really drove me crazy when I was learning ESAR. So you're doing something obvious here. 
right? I am proving something that is a conjunction. I do an induction. I have the inductive step. I know that the thing I'm trying to prove is a conjunction. I can even see there in the output window that it's a conjunction. Yet when I apply, apply this rule that accepts a conjunction, it fails. Why does it fail? Well, it fails because of then. Because then is piping in some other stuff. And when you have then piping in other stuff, and you use rule, which is, you know, you often use rule in single step proofs, uh, it is going to try and match the other stuff with the rule, and that's probably going to fail and drive you crazy. Now, there is a kind of ugly thing you can do here. Um, what you need to do is stick in apply hyphen. Anyone ever try this? This is, again, awful. Eva stuff. Apply hyphen basically is does nothing, but it has the side effect that the sti stuff piped in from before gets dumped in your list of assumptions. So now when you do the following step, which is your conjunction introduction, um, nothing is being piped in because the, 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 the dash on the previous line got rid of it for you. You can see, in fact, if you look at the sub gold there, nothing is being piped in, and instead I have PN and QN as an assumption that I'm being given. So now you can apply your rule. I should say, I don't want to see this in handed in work, but you can possibly help it. I would say it is ugly as, well, I don't want to use bad words, it's ugly as anything. So. Get your proof and say, oh, thank God I proved it. Now make it a bit prettier than that. So you might find a way not to do it that, like that. But it's totally okay when you are messing around trying to get your head around it to do what, anything you like. You can even use things like back, which I'm not telling you about, as long as you get rid of them before you hand it in. Now, just for a moment, I want to talk about a few other things. So there's document preparation. I guess you're all using it, so you've come across this already. I have mixed views about document preparation. Uh, this actually comes from what Donald Knuth called literate programming, which he invented back in the maybe 80s. It's a kind of typical Knuthian anti-modular idea that what would happen if my source code and my documentation were the same document? And the advantage is, with luck, your documentation will be up to date because if you change the source code, you might change the documentation because it's right in front of you, but then maybe you might not because nobody tests the documentation, only the code. So actually, I don't think it is a clever idea, and what's awful about it is that you are now have code in two languages, namely C or whatever, and you know, tech or LaTeX, um, and you can get then errors in two languages. But whatever, Isabel has this. I think it's fine for what I would call light documentation. So you prove a theorem, maybe you give a comment just describing what the theorem is for, and you can even use what you know, anti quotations to generate some Isabel material there to look up theorem names and generate Isabel expressions. They'll all be done perfectly. Um, totally fine. And then when you run through your theory to print out, <coughs> it will look good, and you know the information is there. But even from the earliest days, I saw even some of my closest colleagues wanting to write entire research papers. So they would do their formal development, and the paper describing the development would be embedded with the development itself. Now, that, that's not how I see academic writing, shall we say, right? Uh, plus, it's a pain because now to run LaTeX and build your document, you have to actually run Isabel, and it suddenly takes 50 times longer. So no, um, 
type class. Type classes are very cool, and it's maybe a shame there's not more about them in the course. I'll say a few words here. Code generation, um, another thing I never quite understood myself, but it is really quite cool. And basically it is, well, let me put it this way. In languages like Coq and Lean, the formalism itself defines an executable functional language, also Agda. So in all of these systems, which are based on variants of type theory, an executable functional language is intrinsically part of the formalism itself. Um, now, when these systems generate code, I'm not actually sure what they're doing because this executable functional language they have is not always very practical actually to run. Uh, and you get issues as soon as you want to deal with like numbers greater than about five because if you're going to use unary notation, that's not going to work. Uh, I haven't mentioned it to you, but if you've tried um, generating numbers in Isabel, like with 20 or 30 digits, you'll find that it works and it's reasonably efficient. And that's because the internal representation is kind of not bits, it's binary, but it's symbolic binary, not bits. Now, through code generation, you can actually link your functional programming like stuff to executable code, even in our higher order logic. Even though higher order logic, unlike these type theories, higher order logic has no intrinsic executable meaning at all. We can superimpose one on it by basically saying, that looks a lot like ML, I'm going to run it. And that's what we do. Um, you can go quite far with it, but uh, there, there are limits. I should continue. Um, locales. I should say more. All I will say here is that they allow us to create a first class context in which you can introduce types, introduce variables, which will behave effectively like constants, introduce assumptions, which will behave effectively like axioms, and you can then build big hierarchies of the locales Combining lo other locales, even you can have, um, what do they call it, multiple inheritance, all kinds of cool stuff where, where you are um, building in very elaborate structures. And the nice thing about locales is they are not extending the logic. All it is is a pragmatic extension of the top level because a locale is in principle nothing but a logical predicate in higher order logic. So if you as a simple case, want to assume a bunch of properties of a bunch of parameters, you could just define a predicate to abbreviate those properties and just say P of X, Y, Z, W, you know, like that. Um, but that would get clunky and locales give us a much slicker way of doing exactly that. So I'll say a few bits, a few words more on axiomatic type classes. Um, we can think of it as principled overloading. In fact, it is very similar to the axiomatic type classes of Haskell from which we got the idea. Of course, Haskell, sorry, they don't have axioms in Haskell, they just have code. Um, in Haskell, you could, however, overload, for example, an ordering symbol with at least the idea that it should be an ordering. Here, it, because it's a theorem prover, we can go further and have an ordering symbol like less than or equal and look at, and link it to various axioms connected with orderings from the most basic, this is a partial ordering or even this is a pre-ordering going right up to this is linear ordering or well-founded ordering. And these things actually nest in a hierarchy. So we can prove theorems about, for example, the various properties of orderings under various assumptions. And then when we use it in a particular case like the real numbers, which is kind of linearly ordered, uh, it will do the right thing. Uh, equally for, for example, the multiplication symbol. What does that refer to? 
Um, it could be multiplying natural numbers or integers or complex numbers or quaternions. And as long as you have, and we do have, um, a whole list of different, um, if you like, algebraic properties that you could have with multiplication, whether it's a commutative or not, associative or not, distributive over addition or not. Uh, and again, one can prove large numbers of facts uh, and then bring up the ones that are relevant in a particular case. This is perhaps even more powerful when you look at things like the calculus where the property of a function being continuous, for example, needs the type to be a topological space of some sort. So then whether the type is a type of reals or complexes or quaternions, there are all topological spaces. And so the moment you prove that, which involves uh, justifying some axioms, then you suddenly have continuity defined on whatever that type is that you may perhaps have just declared. Um, I guess I maybe wasn't clear. The point is, when you are working, when you are, you can develop a theory of, for example, uh, a topological space or continuity from just the minimum axioms that you need to talk about a topological space. Then when you introduce, say, the type of complex numbers, you prove it's a topological space and immediately inherit all the stuff that you proved. Uh, so we use this a lot. A few more words about code generation. Uh, and there are now, we support a lot of backends. So we have OCaml. I think we might even have Scala. You would have to look in the manual. Now, these all have to be trusted. So when you, this translation is based on, I think this should be right. Now, one of the cool things here is the proof of so-called code equations. So your definitions of mathematical concepts, you would not normally think about efficiency when you define a mathematical concept. You just want it to be right mathematically. Um, but if you then want code generation to work, you might want to prove alternative versions of the thing you defined, specifically with an eye to executing them efficiently. These are code equations. I'm not going into detail here, just to let you know you can do it, so that you can superimpose, uh, let's say, as a simple example, the idea of a list being ordered. You might define it inductively. You might define it um, in some very naive way. It's like all pairs of lists, you know, that the order at position in the list corresponds to their uh, comparison and the ordering. That would be impossible to execute effectively. But then you could write uh, some equivalent version of testing that a list is sorted that is much more efficient and use that as a code equation. So what people have done quite a bit now is verify and then execute an algorithm. So the algorithm has been verified in Isabel. It's translated into an executable language, although in we have to trust the translation, then you can run the code. Um, we are, we can see the day when we don't have to trust the translation anymore, incidentally. Uh, there has been a lot of work on verified compilers, mostly using Hall, actually. Um, this so-called KML project, which is a way of getting fully verified compilers that you actually get a theorem relating the text of the KML program to a bit string, which is executable on an x86 architecture, and the proof that the program text is semantically equivalent to the bit string is not in a sense, it's not dependent on any kind of giant trusted base. It's only dependent on the correctness of the whole theorem prover itself. Um, that's some very amazing work, which people have been trying to steal for Isabel. And one can then envisage a time 
when we can have um, an actual theorem that a particular Isabel formula is e exactly equivalent to code, it would have to be in this KML language, which can be executed. Um, now, we have eval in Isabel, and I think you've already played with eval, all of you, which actually runs executable expressions by um, reflection. And that is it. So thank you all very much.